afternoon. I'm Dr. Kyla McFarlane, Senior Academic Programs Curator in the Museums and Collections Department at the University of Melbourne. I'm our MC for this afternoon and convener of this M. Potter Museum of Art Interdisciplinary Online Forum on Consent, which is the fourth in an annual series co-presented by the Potter and the Centre of Visual Art at the University of Melbourne. I'm zooming in from Wurundjeri Wadwurrung land and thank you for joining us on Zoom from wherever you are. We've got two really fabulous sessions for you this afternoon, so I'll now welcome Simon to the session. Thank you, Kyla. Um, I'm Dr. Simon Maidman, uh, Associate Director of Art Museums in the U Museums and Collections Department of the University of Melbourne. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm speaking on today, the Wurundjeri uh, Wurrung of the uh, Southeastern Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present, and emerging and their ancestors and in doing so I acknowledge their sovereignty is unbroken and continuing. This ongoing series of Ian Potter Museum of Art forums proposes art making as a form of knowledge creation alongside other academic fields of inquiry. Each features presentations and discussions from our academic colleagues from the University of Melbourne leading voices in their respective disciplines alongside contributions from creative practitioners. Each year, a theme is chosen for the forum that is pertinent to our current moment. And I think you'll agree that this year's topic of consent could not come at a more apt moment, as we are witnessing a seismic shift in society's understandings of consent, consent across interpersonal, institutional, colonial and environmental contexts. Convened by Kyla, who you have just met, this forum has been developed uh, with University of Melbourne colleagues and collaborators, Dr. Danny Butt and Dr. Susie Fraser. And as Kyla mentioned, is co-presented by the university's Center of Visual Art. Thank you in particular also to two members of the Art Museum's team, Jackie Doherty and Annika Aitken, as interlocutors and for the efforts towards this forum's delivery. So today on day two of our forum, we're pleased to bring you to sessions that will examine consent through two sub-themes, decolonization and data and the consumer. We're pleased and honoured to have Professor Barry Judd as session chair this afternoon for our decolonisation session. Professor Judd is Director of Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne. He is a descendant of the Pitjantjara people of Northwest South, South Australia, British immigrants and Afghan camelers. He is committed to the research of issues that impact Aboriginal peoples who live in the arid inland and is a leading scholar on the subject of Aboriginal participation in Australian sports. And I'm particularly drawn, Barry, to your analysis of the early participation of Aboriginal peoples in cricket and their success from which we can quantify the rise of Anglo nationalism in the 20th century. Following the speaker's presentations, Professor Judd will lead a discussion with our panelists. And I hand over to you now, Barry, to introduce the speakers on the subject of consent and decolonisation. Thank you. thank you very much, Simon. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. I too would like to commence my part of the presentation by acknowledging uh, that I speak to you today on the unceded territory of the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people and pay my, spec my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and future. Uh, today we have a fantastic um, lineup of panelists, people uh, who loom large in the Indigenous Studies uh, field in Australia and people whose reputations are global in stature. So I will uh, briefly read the bios, uh, which do not capture um, just how fantastic our panelists are today. But um, our lineup starts with Associate Professor Anne Gervaisi, who teaches at Melbourne Law School. She is an Australian historian and a feminist jurisprudent and part of the team on the ARC funded project, Lawful Relations Encounter to Treaty. Um, Dr. Crystal McKinnon is also co-presenting a paper with Anne. Uh, Crystal is well known to me is a Yamaji academic researcher and community organiser. She is a historian and a critical Indigenous studies scholar who is the Vice Chancellor's Indigenous Research Fellow at RMIT University and a visiting fellow at the Indigenous Law and Justice Hub at the Melbourne Law School. Uh, we are also 
joined today by someone I've recently come to know at the university, academic and artist, Dr. Vanessa Russ. Um, and Vanessa is a former associate director of the Burnt Museum of Anthropology at the University of Western Australia, with family connections to Nyarangi and uh, Jiga uh, community in the Kimberley region, and apologies uh, for if my pronunciation is a little bit off. And finally, uh, we are also joined by REA, um, aka Dr. Ria Saunders, um, who is an experimental interdisciplinary artist, activist from the Gamilaroi, Waiwan, uh, Berapi nations of New South Wales. REA is a lecturer in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies Unit at the University of Queensland. So um, without much further ado, uh, let's uh, jump into the presentations and I welcome Anne and Crystal um, to kick us off in this session. We would also like to begin by acknowledging where we are and whose lands we speak from. And um, today, the uh, nominal lands of Wurundjeri people and our Paris elders, past, present, and those in the future. I also want to thank, too, the hospitality of Indigenous peoples in all the places that we meet today. And so extend some thanks on behalf of Crystal and I to the Potter, uh, to Annika, to Jackie, and most of all, Kyla, for the invitation to participate. Uh, the Potter and Cultural Collections community are important friends and colleagues in my teaching and research at the university, and their creation of a forum like this is really the exemplification of what the university should be about. So that's a big thanks. Consent is a fantastic theme for this event, and I was really grateful yesterday to hear uh, most of the first panel. And what struck me was that despite different disciplinary framing, the pivot, the broader political and cultural conversation was predicated things to say about law and agency and about forms, ethos and participation. This included a commitment, I think, to dissent the law's dominance over language that resides across social input and critique and return arguments about consent to questions of obligation, disposition and ethics. I would agree with most of those conclusions, but would slightly how we orient the language of law. And consent in an Anglo-Australian legal tradition is not necessarily severable from obligation, disposition and ethos. To create a relationship, a negotiated agreement of any kind from contract to treaty involves informed consent before obligations and protocols of conduct are established. Now, that understanding of the role of consent is very old and hasn't changed much. And we know it's impossible to separate from the projects of sovereign dispossession. Have there up on the screen, hopefully you can see that. The, that is Cook's Capital Secret Instructions, the Imperial Authority um, for um, the, the, the moment of uh, colonial dispossession in 1770. So we know that in 1770 consent was required, but we also know it was not given. We also know that consent sent by Aboriginal people since then, but not freely, for the state to do all manner of things in their alleged interests in which the state refused or ignored their own obligations. So what we know then as jurisprudence and historians in Australia is that consent is never absent from authority and only useful for those who have power to exercise it. So this is the basis of the politics of the gesture and language that university people often use to signal what we have learned and understand about our public duties. For example, when you hear people say sovereignty was never ceded, and I am going to just stop sharing for um, a moment. But we want to ask something slightly probably at it. Is that the end of the question for our different disciplinary engagements? So there seems, for example, a more mediated invasion that might be made that doesn't leave the question of consent with a full stop. The full stop leaves the space to see what consent meant and means the assertion of imperial authority in 1770 or 1788 in Gadigal country or at any other point in time, noting the moment not the same for different Indigenous nations. We think that leaves the story one-sided or at least unfinished. So 
So what interests us then are ways of doing our work to pay attention to the ambivalence of consent and how that might be made visible as a field of study and engagement and as collaborative practice. As Barry mentioned, Crystal and I are part of a, a, a multidisciplinary team called for relations from counter to treaty. Um, and our team includes uh, historians and jurisprudence, um, men and women and Indigenous and non-Indigenous um, people. And our overriding um, aim is methodological, to develop and also pay, um, um, to publicly describe innovative and creative practices that are adequate for the task of making visible point of encounter between laws and people over time in the place we use Victoria, and to take attendant insights to shape deliberations on the future of non-Indigenous Australia's duties and legal and social relationships with First Peoples and the current conversation about treaty-making, truth-telling and justice. But just before I hand over to Chris, give you an example of what we mean, I just want to be really clear of language. Lawful relations does not infer that the encounters of settler colonialism or are just, consensual, objectively or truthful. What we're using the language to do is acknowledge that from the moment of first encounter, acts were done in the name of, and language of law, by people who are representatives of own laws and that such an acknowledgement about law is already plural and mediated. And so the use of lawful draws from the worship of Indigenous jurisprudence like Mary Graham, Chris Black and Aaron Watson. And these leaders have authorised how when they speak for land, the land is the source of law. And from that land come forms of role, responsibility and relationship that inform what we in Anglo law might now own in its jurisdiction sovereignty, ownership, and status. So those Indigenous prudence have been writing for others and have invited in that process non-Indigenous people of law, like me, to pay really close attention to our own law in a similar way. So lawful relations and how we've been working with it helps us bring mediated consent into direct doing. Look, if you're looking for a contrast, puts emphasis on the continuation of dispossession from one side without awareness of one's own law or um, the laws of someone else. And a good example of how that ends up is the um, Terran versus a claim that a place is without law. So as scholars in Australia, our obligation is to understand that dispossession is an example of laws content and engage in scholarship through writing about local places, the local answers on the activity of that relationship. So in a project like ours with many colliders, it involves an obligation to demonstrate how historians and law people work with plural concepts in ways that make the shadow of contemporary contestable. The challenge, if you're a non-Indigenous person, scholar like I am, is to be conscious of how writing, the writing we do and the writing we use is already part of a constant reworking of a conflict. So I want to hand over now to Crystal, who will give an example, thinking with an object from the archives, that carries and shows the forms of plural laws and makes it, and she also makes some observations about that as a negotiation um, at the end. So I am um, just want to give the example as um, Anne said about a petition that we, um, our research team, and particularly acknowledge Amanda Laurie's work here in um, uh, finding this uh, petition at the Public Records Office. So just to give some background, um, so the Framlinghang Ab Aboriginal Reserve um, began in the mid-1860s. By about 1867, the Board for the Protection of Aborigines attempted to close Framlingham and move all of the Framlingham residents to another reserve, Lake Conda. But the refusal of Framlingham residents to move saw the BPA change this plan. Um, there was generally about 50 to 90 people living there. On the 28th of August, 1889, Karei Wurrung, Gundijamara, Peak Wurrung and Jab Wurrung representatives, most probably including Framlingham leaders, Colin Hood and William Good, went to Melbourne to visit Alfred Deacon, the chief secretary at the time, and members of the Board of Protection of Aborigines where they protested the closure of Framlingham. Despite this, the Board for the Protection of Aborigines agreed to close the Framlingham Reserve at their 4th of September meeting in 1889. Through September to December, Kariwurrung, uh, Gundijamara, Peak Wurrung and Jabwurrung people, as well as settlers from the local area, protested the closure. Letters were written and published in the press, for instance. By the time it was sent, um, um, 
uh, sorry, um, a petition was circulated by Aboriginal residents to Framlingham Reserve um, to white people living on Kiwurrung, Dwindjajmara, Peekwurrung and Jabberung country in the vicinity of the reserve. By the time it was sent to the Chief Secretary Deacon, over 500 signatures of men and women across Warrnambool, Mortlake, Camperdown, Tarang, Wagoon, Pernham, Port Ferry, Ballingeek, Ellisi, uh, Garvok, Kalura, Panmer, Grassmere and Framlingham, um, all mem members of those communities all signed the petition. Um, and there were many prominent members and you can see the petition on the screen there was addressed to the Chief Secretary after Deacon and it states that the undersigned on behalf of the Aboriginals of the Framlingham Station most humbly beg that the Chief Secretary will not agree to the Board for the Protection of Aborigines proposal to deprive them um, of their home. It notes that this has been their home for at least 20 years and the petitioners appeal to notions of justice and humanity. Their discussion of homes include land and is grounded in place, differentiating um, the petitioners' ideas from the BPA, who often focused on housing and notions of welfare and their arguments to justify moving people from Framlingham. The petitioners called for Deacon to consider that the Aboriginal people at Framlingham were the original possessors of the soil. A newspaper report um, in the Warrnambool Standard noted two Aboriginal men from Framlingham had arrived in Camperdown in mid-September with a petition against the hardship and injustice that would result from the removal of all residents from Framlingham. Uh, the two men are not named. Uh, the petition was sent to the Chief Secretary and in the archives at the Public Records Office, it's housed in the inward registered correspondence. Whilst petitions were regularly presented on the floor of Parliament, there is no record in hand side of Deacon presenting it at all. So whilst it wasn't presented to the floor, it's worth noting that local MPs, John Murray and Sir Brian O'Largan, both of whom raised concerns about the QA, um, both raised concerns about the QA Rung and Good Digimara residents of Framlingham on the floor of parliament. So I wanna, I'll go back to just so you can have a look at the petition. Apologies, it's on its side, but you can get, you can kind of get the gist of the um, length of it. And also um, marvel at the fact that to, um, Two men carried this around on horseback, you know, across such a large, um, a large, a, a large space, I guess. And yeah, anyway, it's it's incredible. But uh, so we've got a few things we wanted to, um, or provocations that we wanted to talk about in regards to the petition and what it means in relation to consent. Um, so the first is that do not be fooled that petitions are about supplication. It's not about asking for possessions or land from the state that aren't already yours or ours. Um, without understanding the context of colonialism and power and race, things such as petitions and letters can appear like people are asking for something owned by the state. They are not. By this, we mean that the types of documents, um, these type of documents could and have been interpreted to indicate that someone is asking for something back that they relinquished or ceased to own or occupy. Aboriginal people, um, sorry, Aboriginal people are people of law and in our own law. And it is not that petitioners are using someone else's law to assert their own. We see petitions as a way that Western law is being strategically used in order to access what is already theirs or ours in terms of Aboriginal people in the context of colonial violence and ever expanding frontiers and land theft. There has been a lot of work done on petitions. Penny Van Torn and Jess Horton come to mind, for example, and also the work of um, Joanna Cruikshank and Julie Evans um, and others in the past. But, um, and they're also on this project as well. But so there's been a lot of work done on petitions by historians who have written about the ways that petitions have been strategically used as a way to resist colonialism in a range of different ways. Um, this petition as right is raising slightly different questions because it originated with Kirewurrung, Gundijamara, Peekwurrung and Jabberung people and it was circulated by them but it was written from the perspective and signed by settler colonists. It's an incredibly sophisticated um, document and shows a deep knowledge of western law. Using white colonists to support what aboriginal people needed and wanting knowing that the state wouldn't and won't listen to aboriginal people ourselves. Consent is limited by power and when people aren't able to exercise that power, like being heard by the state in that meeting at Deacon's office, 
Um, the use of petition shows a skilled and sophisticated strategic use of Western laws. So I want to end by saying this provocation, sovereignty never ceded. There's always a junction after that. It's an ongoing mediated relationship. Saying sovereignty was never ceded is never enough. What are you doing with that knowledge so that it's not merely a gesture to what Aboriginal people know and do as people of law? Thank you. Thank you, Anne and Crystal, for that wonderful presentation. And I do have some questions, but I'll uh, save them for the discussion. Um, I would like now to pass over to Vanessa. Um, thank you. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, my name is Dr. Vanessa Russ. I'm a from the Kimberley region and I'm calling to you from Wajak Budja here in Perth. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm looking at reframing the repatriated object, um, uncovering the meaning from considered access to rematriation of knowledge. And today I'm just going to share with you some commentary on the idea of repatriation and consent and the need to reframe the idea to incorporate the true value of cultural material to Aboriginal Australians. Um, I'm gonna explore language in different ways, so hopefully you'll stay with me. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge that given language in this paper uh, is being questioned and um, that I don't really see myself as a First Nations person. And I notice that this word's been used quite often. Um, alas, the term in my opinion is of value in defining and describing Indigenous peoples in Canada. I'm a proud Australian in its original sense. I, I don't see myself as first or last, and I don't see myself as either Indigenous or Native. To me, my worldview is from the Kimberley, where the Indian Ocean stretches to Timor-Leste, and north of the Buccaneer Archipelago, uh, I am seen as Australian. Um, I'm Aboriginal to Australia, and I pay respects here to my Canadian counterparts, and ask, have we sought consent in Australia to use that term? Um, and again, I'm very interested in this idea that we start to homogenise Indigenous people. So I'm coming from that real Indigenous perspective. Uh, Colonisation has both a covert and overt set of social actions, meanings and values. Uh, this is just in my opinion, I'd love to do some more work on it. That we either acknowledge openly or ignore to meet a certain argument. When we talk about repatriation, for example, we ignore the imbalance that this sort of masculine concept brings in terms of cultural material itself or the meaning of culture. We descend into arguments of ownership and control, not in reuse and reinvigoration based on what might be perceived as British systems of native title, where one must use both tangible and intangible cultural knowledge data to prove rights to tracts of Australia. Um, and again, we go into that idea of sovereignty. It fits in with, for example, our conversations around treaties, um, which I think still have many fault lines that haven't been ironed out. Uh, and those fault lines sit somewhere between the idea of sovereignty and the fact that we remain a colony. And I argue that you can't decolonize a colony. And that's a whole other paper. <laughs> In its original form, repatriation was, as I understand it, about the return of ancestral, or more to the point, human remains. That is the physical removal of dead people in jars and barrels at the point of colonisation for study to institutions across Europe. And while some success has been achieved in their return to country, decisions by some institutions to return legs and arms and not the heads of people, I find very interesting. So let's consider the role therefore of cultural material as knowledge bearer itself. From 2016 until 2019, I was the Associate Director of the Burnt Museum of Anthropology at the University of Western Australia. The first Aboriginal Australian to take up the position. Through my time at the BMA, I found that the collections were impossible to access purely just because of where they were housed. The archives were in the same boxes that they'd been placed in um, from when Catherine had passed away in 1994. And the paintings were rolled up and stored in boxes. You couldn't really even see them um, to the point where they got some damage early on. The store felt like it was full of prisoners seeking to get out. And if only the wall, walls could speak. Through sheer grit, I, along with my very small team of you know, conservationists and registration staff, 
successfully designed, installed and rehoused the entire painting collections. We restructured the entire store so that people felt comfortable coming into it. And we rehoused the entire archive of the Burnt Museum, including Ronald and Catherine Burnt's field notes. From this, we realised that the museum's collections had very small amounts of closed access material, that is material associated to either men's or women's business and a very small amount of ancestral remains, uh, which were of interest because they weren't just bones, they have specific cultural meaning. And so I set about speaking to a partic the particular community about what to do with these things. And their response was, until they knew what they wanted to do, the museum would be a keeping space for that material. Now, why did the Burns acquire those items? It wasn't for mysterious means. They'd been to Millingimby, they'd seen the way that the missions were, were focused on uh, stopping uh, any kind of cultural practices, including mortuary ceremonies, um, and the practice of what happens to the body after someone passes away, and they wanted to keep the life cycle of that ceremony. It's easy to judge. I, I prefer not to. I think that that has some meaning to it that's something we've never really thought about before. Um, so again, very interested in the Burnt's focus on colonial impact on Aboriginal culture, which is all throughout the Burnt Museum. And what the community then wanted um, changed through conversation. Suddenly it was about cultural knowledge data. Um, this wasn't about gaining power and control. It was more about how they could learn from what the Burnt Museum had in a way that would value and add to their current knowledge. So, for example, they started thinking about the BMA as an archive, allowing it to retain the work of conservation and care of those collections for future gen generations, but thinking through ways of rematriating knowledge for reuse. So, for example, they took the barks that we had, um, they took images of those barks, they rethought those stories and people repainted those stories. And now those versions of those stories now sit in their archive. So it's just a different way of thinking. It's not to say it's good or bad, but how do we do it in a way that takes these institutions and reframes them? The problem with the narrative of consent in cultural institutions is that we don't all really know the original bearer of knowledge. Some of those particular designs on the ancestral remains are not known to people today. So who their current family are, who knows about certain aspects of knowledge and who has the right to access or call for repatriation and claim knowledge hold of material that might be 70 or 100 years old is really um, a very contested space. And I'm often of the habit of asking, who is the community? Who are the elders? And how do we tell the difference? We place the burden on living elders, on individuals, and often on those willing to speak, but they may not know and may instead refrain from answering. Does that mean the item one is seeking to share belongs to no one? Or does it mean we need to lock it away, never to be seen again? And how do we navigate that as museums? I think worthy of noting too, in terms of cultural knowledge, is the impact of something social like alcohol in retaining cultural knowledge. The early loss of elders to say kidney failure or cancer from alcohol is, we just don't talk about this. And, and so again, how do we actually understand that in terms of museums and consent? Um, the other part to that is the state's women, uh, states, <coughs> pardon me, uh, states women who are women who have brothers or partners or husbands who are senior men who've passed away and they are now the new holders of knowledge. Does that mean that they can no longer share that knowledge with the young men coming up? We, we're not talking about that either, right? So I think of someone like um, Laurie uh, May Moranga from the Crocodile Islands who spent her last years, I mean, she ended up in her 90s still teaching people language, song and performance, teaching men how to perform songs that she knew as a child. So that real idea of what is that, how, how do we rematriate, rebuild knowledge so that it does go back into some sort of cycles really of, of importance here. And then finally, the idea of ownership. If the Burns purchased through either cash or traded goods, items of cultural material, did they own it? 
And please recognise that there were times and times. We don't live in times when access to solid goods was difficult today, but cer I certainly recall myself uh, booking up stuff at the station at Gib River as a kid. I also recall people exchanging meat for flour and my auntie June used to say that tea, sugar and flour kept people alive. So again, what is ownership? The Burnt's records show that they paid in cash. They paid primarily in tobacco because that's what people asked for. Um, they might have paid in food. And, and again, this is about the reality. You're talking about isolation. You're talking about the local town being maybe a thousand kilometres away or a plane flight away. So the role, that, the role of the museum may in fact be to reteach culture to individuals and communities across Aboriginal Australia who've lost the, that knowledge altogether. These institutions are, after all, Australian. And as an Australian, to be that be that Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, we have a right to demand that our cultural institutions are adequately funded by state and federal governments to deliver this outcome to us. Um, so we need to reframe the value of institutions and how they operate. Um, I also believe, and just to be a little controversial, that our non-Aboriginal supporters who take up the activist anarchist approach to this debate need to also consider the role that they play in possibly denying Aboriginal people access to material through aggressive tactics. And here I just use an example of the Ronald and Catherine Burnt Field Notebooks, which have been embargoed to 2024. Both John Stanton, who was the director prior to me for 38 years, and myself can attest that there was more material in the, in the archive in the museum that is of relevance to culture and community today than just the field notes. That is going to be a 10 year research project on its own. But that material, um, and I can attest to a, a man from South Australia who passed away thinking we weren't providing him with access. But legally, we couldn't provide access to the field notebooks. But what we found in our work was that we could actually provide him with access with the drawings that his grandfather had made. But nobody ever asked us to access the drawings. And in fact, if, it, if the exchange had have been a bit more positive and wasn't about destroying the, the actual staff in the museum, I would have taken that material physically to him to show him. So there is just that approach that we have. We need to actually start reframing the way we think of these things because they are of value, they do have meaning, um, but we also then need to think about how we approach it. And not all institutions are like the Burnt Museum. Um, I, I totally recognise that. We tried really hard to uh, meet as many needs as possible. So I just want to go back into repatriation, re, repatriation, rematriation before I conclude. In 2010, in an American Education Research Association session on repatriating curriculum studies, curriculum scholar Heather Sykes pushed back against the term repatriation for its heteropatriarchal dominance. Eve Tuck takes up this discourse in her paper, Rematriating Curriculum Studies, writing, there are words in other languages that may be more fitting. The inadequacy of the word re repatriation points more to the inadequacy of the English language to describe and facilitate decolonisation. We get blisters, she writes, from using inadequate tools, but blisters can be drained and the work can still be completed. Tuck goes on to ask, when you do your work, do you research people or do you research with people? She says that a curriculum of re repatriation or rematriation is an approach for participatory decolonising educators and scholars, people who choose to consider curriculum in community, not on communities. And so I'll just finish by a final quote that she says, conceptualization of a place that rely on latent notions of property are tangled in the ideals of settler colonialism, depended on constructions of land as extractable capital, the denial of indigenous sovereignty, the myth of discovery and the naturalization of the nation state. A rematuration of curriculum studies is concerned with the redistribution of power, knowledge and place and the dismantling of settler colonialism. And I think, that when we think about these things, we have to really take into account that you can't decolonise a colony, but it doesn't mean that we can't work together to reframe the system. Thank you, Vanessa. Very thought provoking. And again, I have some questions which we might get to. Uh, I would now like to- Okay. Hi, everybody. My name's Ri. I'm Gamilaroi Wawan Therapy People. Um, um, 
the middle and Wawan country meet on the border of two defining pieces of country. One side is the Pelica, the thick bushland, flat glowing with red dirt and is blooming with native flowers in spring. And the other side is the Warrumbungle mountain ranges, an old sacred volcanic rock formation, an important sacred cultural site that connects my people to the Seven Sisters songlines that flows from the north and the west of Australia across the Ngamilawe Wawan country. My name, Re, is an act of reclamation in itself. I acknowledge the Darug people as the traditional custodians of the land in which I live and work. I pay my respects to elders, past and present, and extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I acknowledge that this land has long been a place of teaching, learning, and creating. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So my talk today or my presentation is looking at um, how I approach uh, um, consent and decolonization in my practice. Um, so the title of my paper is Decolonizing Archi the Archive Through the Reperformance of the Black Body. In this presentation, I will contextualize our consent and decolonization or the lack of consent this framing is evident in my practice and explored in the relationship in, making, in the making of Look Who's Calling the Kettle Black, which will be 30 years old in 2022 and poles apart. These works speak to each other through the spirit of my grandmother, Ruby Pearl Leslie. Um, the power of her spirit flows through me and ignites the courage and resilience that drives me to do the work I do. As I gather the traces of colonial subjugation, what I experience in making this work is often traumatic. That said, there is also not anywhere else to garner our history from sources other than ourselves. I continually choose to practice in processes of personal assemblage, to trace the steps that I take in order to heal the trauma I carry. The gathering and assemblage of memory has been imperative for me in forming the visual and sensory elements of my creative work. My art making, writing and research draw extensively on an innate personal history that is always in collision with colonial history. I explore points of collision collectively through the use of photography, sound, moving image and sight responsive sensory practice. I, my research employs a combination of critical and creative forms of writing to include personal narrative, biography, autoethnography, history, and, and formal critical analysis. The experimental diversity of this approach, as witnessed in both my art making and writing practice, is required to evidence what Mari scholar and activist Linda Tui Smith claims is the vital work of voice, voicing Indigenous derived terms and frameworks within academic Indigenous research, research on contested histories. The researching of Indigenous contested histories requires forms of gathering together and writing beyond traditional media, academic sources and established genres. Tui Smith describes contested accounts are stored within genealogies, within the landscape, within weaving and carvings, even within the personal names that many people carried. The means by which these histories were stored was through our system of knowledge, systems of knowledge. Many of these systems have been reclassified as oral traditions rather than histories. My work explores contested histories through practice-led creative research, drawing upon multiple sources of authority, history and voice through the practice-led methodologies. I provide testimony and bear witness to my research as a journey and process of self-discovery that is specific to my identity as an Indigenous new media artist. It prioritises Indigenous-derived academic perspectives and methodologies that have been adapted by Aboriginal researchers in order to develop ways to speak from my own cultural standpoint and lived experience. This methodology assists in cultural maintenance and presents our own epistemological truths in order to regain knowledge 
knowledges lost from colonization and or Western ethnocentrism. It aims to revitalize at-risk knowledges to attend to marginalized or dismissed aspects of what counts as knowledge and thus produces more complex and transformative kinds of Aboriginal decolonial forms of knowledge and art. It is important to not forget that language is part of the colonial regime. My work challenges the old ideas and spaces in which our bodies have been documented. The language of colonialism, specific the language of art history, has prov proven to narrate me and my history in a backward direction. We are Aboriginal people, we as Aboriginal people are everywhere, yet we are nowhere to be seen in early Australian paintings, drawings, documents, and stories that were told by the colonizers. With regard to the demanding impact that such colonial narratives have had on us, American author and activist Bell Hooks describes the discourses, the discourse, sorry, of the other as functioning to annihilate and erase certain kinds of bodies, as she writes, no need to hear your voice when I can talk about you better than you can speak about yourself. No need to hear your voice. Only tell me about your pain. I want you, I want to know your story. And then I will tell it back to you in a new way. Tell it back to you in such a way that it has become mine, my own story. Rewrite you, I write myself in you. I am still author authority. I am still the colonizer, the speaking subject. And you are now at the center of my talk. Rather than asking to be added on or added into the non-Indigenous art history and new media canon, as Indigenous artists and scholars, we should instead refer to what is growing, what is a growing Indigenous specific canon of art and media history albeit small and still emerging. We need to strive to develop our own methodologies and frameworks as much as possible. Art history and theory have largely been predicated on the exclusion of indigenous frameworks and theories. And I just wanted to kind of, um, I guess, draw on the definition around consent and so the definition that I found that talks about consent says no change may be made without the consent of all the parties. And decolonization, they thought they could assist the process of decolonizing and local self-determination. And you know, as Eve Tuck's already been um, mentioned today, Eve Tuck's and Wayne Yang, um, talk about decolonization brings out the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our society and schools. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful presentation. It's always difficult when there are technical issues. So um, that was wonderful. And um, I can always um, appreciate uh, when it when I get to hear from academics who are also practicing artists, uh, you have a way of uh, speaking about these things that's so much more interesting than the rest of us. So thank you. Um, let's open up the discussion now. And um, as I was trying to conceptualize the thread uh, for each of the presentations, I was thinking about. Um, Indigenous knowledge systems and ontologies and the idea that Indigenous ontologies are not actually about being, they're about doing. And I want to open up perhaps with a question to the first presenters around the petition from Framlingham and uh, their neighbours. Um, do you think that it's possible to see um, those practices of protest in the 19th century and beyond? They're still going on today in terms of a continuation of traditional Indigenous political practices. And I'm thinking about uh, what might be called experiential treaty making processes 
And in this part of the country, we might reference that through something like Tandiram ceremonies. Absolutely. I think it's, um, you know, as um, black fillers, we are people of law. That's like what, you know, and I guess that's what we were trying to say that um, don't be fooled that um, just because we're using means like petitions that you know that we're, we're using them strategically and using um um you know when you're using your um like you say like doing it's about doing and um being in and of sovereignty like um professor ali morton robinson says being in and of country and in and of place that's what that means and so when you're drawing it out and talking about um um, it being within a historical continuity of um, sovereignty and law, that's exactly what we what what we believe, and that the current um, the current negotiations of treaty and um, you know all of the other uh, new things that people are endeavouring on. Um, I, I I see it in the same in the same way. Um, yeah, see it in the same thread of historical continuity of sovereignty, law, um, yeah, and resistance, yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I, you know, I agree with all of that. Just would add also to see, I think you're quite right, Barry, to understand something as law, which, you know, in the non-Indigenous space, is a, that's, that's the key move. You know, this is not just a political ask. This is a, like a, a, a formation of um, legal relationship and assertion of, of law, and that sort of deviates or moves away from the, the contested space of saying, you know, it's the languages of sovereignty and other things are imports, like they're questions about um, political ideas that are coming from Western political tradition. So to, to actually be able to say there is a public law between nations, you know, look at all the restatement at the heart, that's a summit of Indigenous nations speaking law to law and just asking you know, the the, colon, the colonial law to actually sort of be paying attention to what that kind of looks like as, as a set of practices and, and, and responsibilities. So, yeah, we that's exactly um, uh, where we're coming from. Are there any um, questions coming up in the chat? I'd better check. Uh, not as yet. Uh, so I will proceed by asking questions of my own. Um, now, one thread that I noticed uh, running through all of these presentations is the emphasis on relationships and building relationships. And uh, for me as an academic, it's a bit of a constant uh, frustration that some people think that that is uh, a seminar at University House with a bit of wine and cheese thrown in for entertainment. Uh, but we all know, don't we, I'm um, talking to the presenters, that relationships that are meaningful and genuine and ethical and are based in consent are often developed over 5, 10, 15, uh, 20 years or indeed a lifetime. So I I'm wondering whether um, either Rhea or Vanessa would like to respond to that in terms of uh, relating that idea of relationality and perhaps mm. also um, Indigenous ideas of relationality through kin-centric systems of understanding the world, how that kind of idea impacts your own work? Um, to the work that I showed and the work that, that I've kind of focused on here is um, just these two main works because of the importance of the first work um, Look Who's Calling the Kettle Black, which was, as I mentioned, it, it, it was created in 1992 and uh, it was my first major digital work and it hasn't really been written about in the history of Australian art history um, because people don't know how to approach that medium with, in relationship to Indigenous artists. And still, I mean, that's the whole reason I wrote a PhD, not because I really wanted to, I wasn't really interested in a PhD, um, and, um, and then along the road after 1992, in 2009, I made a piece of work called Poles Apart, which by then um, made reference back to Look Who's Calling the Kettle Black because my grandmother appears in the, one of the images. And so Look Who's Calling the Kettle, the Black, came, Look Who's Calling the Kettle Black series came out of my personal response to the release of uh, Black Deaths in Custody um, report. 
which came out in 1992, I think it was. And I was really concerned that the emphasis was on Aboriginal men only. Now, today I know that there was probably about five women included in that report, uh, but they were never really spoken about in public. And so I thought about all of the Indigenous women who died in custody in those positions that they were stolen and farmed out into as servants. And my grandmother was one of those women who was taken to Kudamundra. And all the women in this series of 10 little images are all women who um, were taken to Kudamundra and ended up being servants. Um, and many of those women died in those positions or they died on the fringes of cities and towns because they never knew exactly where they came from. My grandmother was very lucky because she did know where she, she came from because her father was in the light horseman and he was allowed to write to her. So she knew her country and her and her sister Sophie both went back to country when they were released from their positions at the age of 18. And then so we come down the track a little bit more and the performance aspect comes into the work then about my body. Um, I think I probably did about 15 years of work almost before I realised that I was visible now in body. And so the work then translated to my body representing the black body in the landscape that was left out of the Australian, um, you know, painting era and how um, history. Um, and the only, only time our bodies are, 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 are in it is, is when it's about um, massacres. So they're the relationships. Thank you. I'm so sorry I'm prompting you to, to stop okay. because I, I believe that um, some of our panellists now have to leave. Okay. Um, so I, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to say thank you for the presentation and for answering my question. Thanks so much, Barry and everybody. And in answer to your question, yeah, we are the long-term research relationships with each other and with our other um, collaborators are, you know, are meant to be some sort of a, a performance and, and um, ethical representation of exactly what you did. So um, we do have to go. So I'm really I apologise for that. And um, thank you very much. And all the other presenters too. So thanks very much. Sorry about that, Ray. You, you're copying all the technical. Uh, problems here today, <laughs> aren't you? I, I'm wondering, um, we've got a few minutes. I think we can go for another uh, seven, eight or nine minutes. And I'd like to bring Vanessa Russ into yeah. the conversation. And um, Vanessa, you, you touched on some very um, practical um, issues concerning museums and collections of Indigenous cultural artefacts and ancestral remains. And I, I guess many of us um, who would consider themselves on the progressive side of politics um, have difficulty grasping um, the idea that for many Indigenous communities, uh, perhaps particularly in Northern Australia, uh, people often do not necessarily want objects or even ancestors returned because of some of the practical issues that you raised. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether you might um, be able to uh, talk about the issue of um, gatekeeping that sometimes happens around institutions when very well-meaning non-Indigenous people um, working in them use the cover of secret and sacred to often um, bar community-based researchers and others from accessing materials that would be very useful to them in terms of um, rebuilding relationships with their uh, kin and family and also um, reconstituting cultural practices. Yeah, oh look, um, I just want to jump back to Ray's point that um, I'm researching uh, Indigenous art history from Asia because I think uh, we have so Europeanized uh, Australian art history that we don't even recognise white Australian artists properly in our art history. So we need to really think through where Australia is from an Asian perspective, in my opinion, to see if we can come up with just new ways of thinking. I'm not trying to reshuffle uh, too much the cards, but I just think that they don't quite work for us at the moment 
as we move forward, I'm, I'm a big fan of thinking through what we want Australia to be in the future. Um, really good question, uh, Barry. I, I think one of the things that really impacts on museums is that they have staff that have been there for a long time. And once we started to get this movement of consent away from uh, no conversation to some conversation where community were actually asking questions and then having the institutions had to respond, people didn't want to make mistakes, um, whether that was used as a, as a barrier, where I don't want to do the wrong thing, so I won't do anything. Um, some of that was about those people having such a passion for collections that they didn't want anyone to have them but themselves. And that again is how do we actually liberalise the internal functions of institutions when people have been there for 30 years and we know state institutions are notorious for creating people who believe that they are the institution and that the other things in it are just like stuff. Um, what I found uh, when you get to the bottom of the conversation around this idea of returning material is the sense of not being Australian, therefore that's not my space. And I think I'm trying to, you know, my father raised me with the idea that I'm Australian first. I mean, he's a man that didn't really leave the Kimberley for his whole life until the later years. Um, and he only drove around Australia, he's never been out of Australia. So that idea of being Australian as being the first part of our conversation, when we let go of that word and we allow some other words to come in and replace it, we then start letting go of our actual ownership of country. You know, like we really start to allow the erosion of small things at a small time. In terms of cultural, cultural material, um, some materials can actually impact on the concept of Mother Earth and of the actual um, place in which those materials were removed from. So, for example, if you remove uh, a, one of the um, epic works from the Barat Peninsula, and they're pretty hard to move because they're rock, but you can, there are smaller e examples of them, that then disturbs the, the space, the place, and do community want those things to be brought back if they've been taken out of country? Have they changed their, has their, has their spirit changed? And then do you bring them back with a different spirit? Or has that spirit been impacted? And then does that impact on country? I mean, these are bigger questions that need to be asked of all cultural material. But I, I you know, I had the really good opportunity to talk to Bob Tonkinson um, uh, about three, four years ago about this idea of the performance, the actual spirit of materials, that, that really um, a boomerang is just a piece of wood until someone actually gives it its spirit, sings to it, um, uses it. Um, the performance of things that make culture are, are more than the object themselves. Although, I mean, we can go into hours of talking about the, the practice of incising boomerangs with rat's tooth that's so hard, but if they do it really well, it shows your cultural knowledge and skill, right? So, yeah, so it's really complex. We don't think about it enough because we get caught up in the ownership and control debate. When I guess my thing is we need to actually get caught up in uh, protecting the knowledge of those that have it who might be ill and we might lose, um, making sure that's linked up to those collections. How do we make those collections more accessible through other means? It may actually be technology we've not thought of before. Um, and also then ensuring that next generation actually understands it before the current generation goes. It's, all good. Uh, it's really hard in Zoom, isn't it? I wish we were in person. Um, I might direct this to Ria. Um, could you say anything more about the impossibility of uh, decolonizing a colony, given all institutions are part of colonial settings, legacies? Uh, Ria, is yeah. this in part why your work hasn't been written earlier? Um, my work hasn't been written about really because um, in the 70s, when the Renaissance movement of Indigenous art came out of the Papania Tula, um, uh, White Australia decided that that was the model for Aboriginal art. And that was the model that sold internationally. And so it was about dollars. So artists like myself who don't work in that space, they locate us based on um, where we live. And there's also a location based on identity. Um, and so it's... Uh, 
it's it's a, a, again another implication of of, uh, of colonization making decisions about uh, who I can who you know what we can be and what kind of art we can make and so I've worked for over 30 years in the digital space because it's allowed me to make the kind of work I want it without it being um, you know um, stereotyped and categorized within this colonial framework but the opposite side of it is that I don't have any history <laughs> apart from that I've been working for 30 years. So, um, of course, you know, I'm writing and uh, working in a university now and uh, moving more towards, towards publishing myself because that's the only way the, 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 the story will be told. So, so it's, it's really about the investment in stereotypes that the coloniser has and needs to keep. It's very similar to what Vanessa was saying. The gatekeepers, the investment in keeping that gate closed or managing that gate within the research institutions is really important to those people that manage that. It's the same within the arts. And so until we all look at it in a very broader way and challenge those um, you know, positions, perceptions, um, it's not gonna change. Um, what a wonderful session. Uh, we are definitely out of time now. We've, we've run 10 minutes over, uh, maybe more. Um, look, I would like to wrap us up now by thanking uh, all the panellists, REA, Vanessa, uh, Crystal and Anne. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Barry. It's okay lovely, to say, Ray. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> <laughs>